Thank you very much for uh, allowing me to be part of this amazing um, event here in um, um, Dharamsala, McLeod Ganj. Uh, so I'm very pleased to be here and I'm, uh, I'll be the first one to switch into a slightly different um, way of thinking about the mind but which is more experimental. So in the tradition, you could say that I'm a part of um, within cognitive science, we actually don't take um, asking people questions very seriously. And instead, what we try to do is coming up with um, experiments and we measure people's response times and accuracies and try to infer from that what's going on in their mind. So it's, it's a bit like continuing on the line uh, of work that uh, Catherine uh, Shepard introduced. So today I'll be talking about how uh, we could find some evidence for um, effects of meditation on the mind uh, by using computational models. And the reason I really like computational models is they are very much an exercise in clear thinking. So hopefully over the course of this talk, what I mean with that uh, will become a bit more clear. So meditation has been associated with many benefits um, demonstrated in all kinds of different studies. So people have uh, use the self-report measures that we've talked about this morning. So uh, one of the clearest findings is that um, mindfulness meditation seems to reduce people's depression. There have also been uh, effects shown on really biological measures. So there's been evidence for an improvement in the immunity system. Uh, also differences in... Um, in a part of your DNA that's called telomerase, which has been associated with um, becoming older. Actually, the shrinkage of that has been reduced in people who went on a three-month-long intensive shamatha meditation retreat. And um, in different lines of research, um, which are more the kind of things that I'm focusing on, people have seen changes in attentional functioning of meditators. Um, so today I'll be talking about a study that's here referred to, um, uh, or that's actually not referred to, um, but today I'll be talking about one of these studies that looks a bit at attention and memory. Um, I've also later done some studies, for example, the one I refer to here, Van Vught and Slachter, which I recently completed. We looked at how people's attention changes when they practice different types of meditation. So you can even use experiments to disentangle that. And it turns out, for example, that in one type of meditation where they really focus intensely on the stimulus, then people um, have a tendency to get stuck on perceiving stimuli on the screen and therefore they sometimes miss other things that come rapidly thereafter. Whereas if they're practicing a type of meditation in which they are just generally aware of whatever arises in their experience, they can really see stimuli that are represented at a very rapid pace. And previously, um, people had shown improvements in uh, the ability to see that rapidly, but it was not known um, whether that was generic to any type of meditation or whether it depends on the type of meditation that people practice. Anyway, those are just some background um, findings, but all of these previous studies have really uh, focused on general task performance. So what they do there basically is, you know, you sit people in front of a computer and you ask them to give um, to respond to images and words that you present on the screen. You measure how quickly they do it, how, um, uh, how correctly they do that, and then you try to infer things from that. But of course, in these responses, in the rapidity and in the accuracy, we don't really know what's exactly going on. Um, kind of akin to the question that came up this morning, you know, if we observe a slower response to negative stimuli, then what is really happening there? Um, and so in the case of attention tasks, there could be different reasons why people 
get faster or why they get better? Is it that their attention is sort of stronger so that they are uh, able to perceive things more clearly? Or is it that uh, they get more accurate because they're just more cautious in making a response? Or is it they get faster because they are just more quickly able to press a button? All of these things can be a cause for a change in how fast people respond and how accurate they are. Um, so to disentangle all of those possibilities, um, what I do is I make use of models of cognition. And what I mean by that is I can write pieces of computer code or I can write down equations that you can simulate on a computer that when you give them the same task as the human, they should produce roughly the same results. Um, and then by turning on different knobs of those computer simulations, I can see sort of what kind of mechanisms in my model do I have to change when people start meditating, for example, to reproduce their behavior. So here in the picture, you can see the, we've demonstrated the idea. Um, on the left, you can see sort of a cartoon of a real brain, and a real brain would be doing tasks like learning French words, cycling, all kinds of things. And on the right, you can see a computer simulation that would also be like a brain, and that would also be maybe learning French words or Tibetan words for that matter, um, or biking or walking around. And what we try to do is match those two up as closely as possible. And then when circumstances change, we, have, we can see what's in these computer models we have to change to produce the corresponding change in behavior. Um, so that's the approach that I'm going to demonstrate in my talk. So in the first experiment that I will be talking about, we investigated how clearly people can remember things. And we wanted to see whether meditation, um, in that case, it was um, shamatha meditation. People were practicing what's called the four foundations of mindfulness. Um, and they did that for a month long. We tested them before and after that month, and we wanted to see whether the things they could remember were of, um, had a much clearer quality. So here you can see somebody trying to remember a face. Those are the kinds of faces that we gave people to remember. So you can see they're quite abstract and you um, actually really have to remember, uh, memorize the details of the face to be able to distinguish different versions of that face that we gave them. So this is the task they, they got. Um, they first saw a sequence of about three faces presented one after the other. And here you can see how they kind of look like one another. So it's hard to distinguish them. Then they waited for a few seconds and then we presented them with yet another face. And we looked at their decision about whether that last face was one of the faces we asked them to remember. So then, you know, once they knew their answer, they responded and um, we could look at their responses. Um, so we gave this task to 29 experienced meditators at Shambhala Mountain Center in Colorado in the United States and compared to the 29 controls who just went about their normal life. They had about the same age and education and gender balance. Um, so yeah, and here you can see the stupa of uh, Shambhala Mountain Center. It was quite a fun study to do, to get to go there a couple of times. Um, so yeah, they did this task and then our models come in. So the way we think that people do this kind of a task is that when they see that probe image, the last image, and they have to formulate the response is um, they start to accumulate evidence over time. So here, each one of those lines represents this evidence accumulation process. It's wiggly because it's noisy. And um, we think that people make their response as soon as they reach a decision threshold. So that's, uh, those are the horizontal lines that you see there. So 
people's response time is then determined by um, the time it takes people to reach that decision threshold to which we add some constant time that represents the time you need to simply perceive a stimulus which takes maybe uh, just over a hundred milliseconds plus some motor delays because you always need a little bit of time to implement a motor response once you've made your decision. Um, so there we, the model can predict the response time and the model also predicts what response you're going to give because if it reaches say the upper threshold then you're going to say in this case yes and if you reach the lower threshold then you're going to say no. Now what's nice about this model is that if we feed this model with a whole range of responses that people have given us plus the response times then it can actually give us an estimate for uh, what people's non-decision time is but also at what height they put their decision thresholds. And that's interesting because it tells us how cautious people are. If they put their decision threshold very far from the beginning, from the starting point, that means they collect a lot of evidence before they decide to give their response. So they are very cautious. And of course, conversely, if they are very close to the starting point, then even a random fluctuation can bring them over the threshold and they probably make lots of errors. Um, in addition to that, um, the model gives us an estimate of how clear the evidence is. Because you can imagine that if you have very clear information that you can just race towards the threshold and make your response and you're done. Whereas if the evidence is much more ambiguous, if you're like, is this it? Is it something else? Then it takes much longer to actually reach that uh, decision threshold. So it's more the more shallow line. So our model gives us estimates of that and we can look at how they are affected by the meditation practice. So here are the results. On the left we look at the decision threshold. So how far from the beginning do people place their threshold for responding, which tells us how conservative they are. And basically we found that on the left you can see the meditators, the meditation training. On the right you see the controls, uh, sorry, on the light gray you see the controls. And um, the meditators had a much uh, of a decrease in the decision threshold um, the second time we tested them, whereas the controls did not change. So that means they needed less evidence to respond than the controls. What we also observe, probably much more interestingly, is that the meditators, you can see that in the right graph, they increase their drift rate, which means that the evidence on which they based their judgment was clearer. Now, how is that possible? We gave them the same faces, right? Well, that is, we think, because they practice meditation and they had less noise in their mind, as it were, and therefore the evidence that they actually were able to extract out of the faces that we presented them was much clearer. And actually the controls did not change, or if anything, they actually got worse. So here we show that um, after a month-long shamatha retreat, there seems to be an evidence for an increase in, increase in mental clarity that we could really find out by, um, by really focusing very deeply on the exact mechanisms that might be involved in performing this task. Another example of um, is very precise mental measurements are um, of a group of um, people that were suffering from depression and um, we looked at how they are remembering emotional information and to what extent they were actually getting stuck in this emotional information because um, our models of this what's called a free recall process which is you know you learn a list of words and you ask people now you know reproduce the list of words in any order that you like and um, our models of that process had suggested that it makes sense to actually look at what kind of transitions do people make when they remember a list of words. Do they um, keep repeating positive words or do they switch from positive to negative to neutral words or how exactly do they do that? 
So we looked at that in this group of um, uh, people who are suffering from depression. So just in a little bit more detail, the task that we asked them to do is, um, you know, they received a list of about 20 words in the study phase, so it could be like cat, eagle, ring, pen, book, and for every word they were asked to say how pleasant they thought the word was and how aroused um, they were by feeling uh, that word, how arising it, it felt. And then they had an intermission of 15 minutes, and then we asked them, okay, now, you know, uh, reproduce the list of words in whatever order you like. And we then crucially focused on, you know, were they clustering, getting stuck in remembering negative words, as you would expect from people who are depressed, or were they able to switch between negative and neutral and positive words? Um, so the people who did this were 52 depressed patients and 29 of those were randomly assigned to mindfulness-based cognitive therapy and 29 just received their normal treatments. So in mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, they do mindfulness practices, they also practice decentering like we uh, talked about this morning and importantly they, they cultivate this attitude of being willing to remain present with unpleasant stimuli or sensations. And so we looked at to what extent do these people um, then, uh, when they recall lists of words, do they get stuck in remembering negative words or are they able to stay with positive words? So here on the left we look at their tendency to stay with positive words and in green you can see them before the training and in yellow is after the training. In the left column you see the mindfulness-based cognitive therapy and in uh, the right column there is the controls. You can see that people after mindfulness-based cognitive therapy are much better able to stay keep recalling positive words once they were doing that. And conversely, in the right graph, you can see that actually they're much less uh, have a tendency to get stuck in recalling negative words. And controls actually show pretty much the opposite pattern. So they're much more stuck in remembering negative words. They can't get out of that. Um, so that's one effect of this mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. And another um, thing we looked at is, you know, after these 15 minutes, um, how do they start recalling words? Which gives an indication of what kind of mood they're in. Because if you're in a more positive mood, you will be much more likely to remember positive words than when you're in a negative mood. And um, if you uh, look at the graphs here, you can see that actually um, at, at the first time, so in the green graphs, there's, much, uh, there's not much of a difference between the mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, MBCT, and the controls. However, at the second time, you can see there's a marked reduction in uh, the tendency to start with a positive word for the controls relative to mindfulness-based uh, cognitive therapy, and actually the corresponding increase in starting with negative words. Now, um, why would there be such an increase in negativity? Well, that's because we gave them the very nasty task that Emiliana talked about yesterday, you know, where you have to give a, a speech in front of a very critical, very stern looking audience. So people didn't like that at all, and they were probably a little bit traumatized by it. But actually, as it turned out, the mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, we think, may have had some protective effect so that they were still able to, even with that experience, remember positive words and uh, not get stuck in the, in the negative words. So these are just some uh, a few examples of uh, how we can use our cognitive experiments and our models of the mind, our very precise models of the mind, to dis dissect, really, how um, mindfulness and shamatha meditation might affect our minds. Uh, so in experiment one I showed you that um, shamatha meditation leads to a reduction in mental noise. In experiment two I showed you how mindfulness-based cognitive therapy seems to lead to a reduction in getting stuck in negative information and uh, although I don't have time to talk about it right now, we had a lot of fun actually in the workshop discussing um, 
about how we could model the process of meditation itself. How could we get a computer to meditate? Of course, I don't really believe that the computer can meditate, but it's a useful thinking tool to think very precisely, you know, what processes are involved in meditation and how would that then affect our general cognitive processes. So that's it. Many thanks to collaborators Amishija, Helene Slachter and Willoughby Britton and thank you for listening. <coughs> ที่ว่าประชาชนนะตั้งอยู่ก้มดาวเดวายอยู่ในแฮปปี้เนสคาริเชเวนะซิมจิกาลทุกอย่างนะคือเนี่ยเกณฑ์นั้นมาสมาช
a lot of the models of cognition that I'm talking about, um, I'm thinking about, focus mostly on the conscious part of experience. Um, so they don't really describe as much about what's going on unconsciously, although they typically have a description of it. So um, my meditation model would have um, would describe consciousness in terms of you know the kind of memories that can be retrieved those would be conscious and there might be other memories that are less active you cannot easily retrieve them and those would probably be unconscious for the model now that just says something about the mind and actually a lot of the cognitive models that we have are, are not explicitly related to the brain. Um, however, of course, Western, there's a lot of Western scientists that talk about consciousness in um, relation to the brain. And um, I think the consensus would be in Western science that we think that d consciousness definitely depends on the brain. So it's clear that if you zap people's brain, there is a difference in people's consciousness. If you cut out a part of someone's brain and they still survive, um, there's a change in their consciousness. If you entirely remove their brain, I, I haven't heard of those stories, so I can't say anything sensible about that. Um, but in general, without a brain, it's uh, quite hard to be conscious. And in fact, if you look at someone's brain and it doesn't show any activity at all, um, there's a 99.9% .9 chance they're not, not conscious, although there might be near-death experiences that we don't have very much scientific evidence about. So again, we can't say very much about it in terms of science. Um, but it is clear that the way you experience the world does depend to some extent on your brain. Um, so, yeah, it, it, for example, one pretty plausible uh, theory of consciousness uh, defines it in terms of, you know, what part of the brain work together is your... Um, uh, is your brain fo functioning in terms of just a very local island that can only basically is, is basically occupied uh, with perceiving whatever is there in the world and, and it doesn't translate much further up in the higher levels of your brain that have to do with sense making then that would be a, a sign of, of, of someone who is not very conscious. Um, so when you're asleep, for example, your perceptual impressions won't make it all the way to uh, f far up in your brain. When you are awake, then um, there is um, a much further uh, propagation of brain activity. So those are some of the theories that I think make more sense. And, and the cutting edge of consciousness research is really focusing on these different types of brain states. So you look at people for example, in a vegetative state that have had an ed accident and cannot respond anymore. So what's different about their brains? And, uh, well, we are far from knowing what's really going on. It's not my area of expertise, but we are uh, approaching an era where, where we can begin to test uh, systematically some of these hypotheses. There are studies where we can have reversible lesions in the brain where uh, certain parts of the brain are hyperstimulated so that it is more active and there are other parts of the brain that are temporarily knocked out. So perhaps we can, um, in the laboratory, achieve the state of someone without a head. <laughs> Any gum de any low lid on the map up ne any pitutani and it tandabat any pin new chichu karachum sutra, the mambalachirangi tajuso la pinne uh cases yung saragi chirangi dinsu kasi siora or di uh since uh you yourself is a very uh, good meditation uh, uh practitioner, um so based on your your own experience so what kind of the benefits uh, uh, we can gain from the kind of work that you are doing, the computational modeling of the uh, cognitive um, experiences? And what kind of ben benefits 
uh, we can expect uh, from this kind of research in the future and how confident you are about uh, the kind of benefits that uh, we may get in the future. That's another great question. Um, I'm not sure whether I'm such a good meditation practitioner, but let's not talk about that. Um, I think that the, the work that's been done so far in terms of the cognitive um, correlates or, or the effects of meditation on cognition is really preliminary. Um, we focused on a lot of attention tasks because you know, in meditation instructions, that's what it emphasizes. So it's a good starting point in terms of developing theories of what might be going on. However, I don't think this is actually really the core of what's going on. So in the second study where I focused on people's tendency to get stuck in certain types of mental patterns, I think judging from my own experience, that's a much more important effect of um, meditation and I'm very much uh, thinking very hard these days about how I can develop new measures that can really get at that because for me uh, in terms of my own experience you can really see how people change when they start practice med practicing meditation you can sometimes see how they become um, more flexible, more fluid, have a bit more humor about themselves. Um, but in terms of our cognitive theories of the mind, it, it's very hard to find the concepts and measures that people find believable, that are reproducible, and that still catch some of that um, quality. So that's one reason why I'm now working on uh, a, a comp computer model of meditation to help me or help us really as a community build a better theory, a sort of a Western counterpart maybe of Buddhist psychology of what's really going on here. So there's, again, we're still just only starting to, to, to investigate this. Well, I have a question for you, Marik. Um, in the beginning of your talk, you mentioned a distinction between a shamatha type of meditation, uh, the, the changes being that, that an individual was better at detecting very small changes in a stimulus, a sort of an increase in perceptual acuity. And then you spoke of open monitoring kinds of meditation um, producing a different kind of benefit, which is a, a better capacity to notice a wider range of perceptual information that perhaps is presented very rapidly out of the scope of focus. And, and this brought me to a question that also is related to one of the collaborators that you thanked, Willoughby Britton, who is someone whose work I'm when I think of her, I think of some of the work she's done that suggests that there are some pitfalls, some, some harm that can happen with certain kinds of meditation. And so I wonder if your computational modeling will be able to tell us a little bit more about um, the sort of synergistic benefit, a little bit like what you were just saying of, of a flexible, adaptive, and multifaceted meditation approach instead of a sort of singular, I'm only going to do shamatha, or I'm only going to do compassion, or I'm only going to do open monitoring. Has there been some evidence that just one kind of meditation can actually be deleterious or harmful? I also really appreciate Willoughby Britton's work on potential pitfalls of meditation. I think it's really important question because we in the West tend to have developed this idea that you know meditation and mindfulness they're going to solve all our problems and that in itself is of course a huge trap. Um, in terms of my computational model I'm not sure how much it can say about that. Uh, what I've understood from Willoughby's work so far is that what tends to be a tremendous pitfall in Western practitioners probably in particular is the tendency to indeed, as you suggest, focus so much on um, one type of meditation and in particular on progressing through different levels that that becomes the aim in itself rather than, um, you know, 
working with the mind and, and becoming maybe, um, uh, yeah, how do you say that? Even becoming a better human is, is already a, a, a sort of goal where you can get stuck into. Um, um, but it, it's this tendency, uh, as far as I understood, the, this striving tendency that we probably are particularly prone to in the West that also might be underlying some of the depression problems that we talked about this morning and the anxiety, like I'm not good enough. I think that's probably all talking about the same tendency. And um, yeah, um, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing more about that work so that we can better understand what the potential pitfalls are and therefore also maybe better advise people or see when they go off in, in this kind of a path and it becomes a hindrance rather than a help because of course meditation is not just about concentration and if you're trying to just cultivate concentration and there is no aspect of altruism or compassion and it's just about becoming a superhuman or something like that that's um, where a lot of problems will probably start uh, Chemangel uh, two questions. Uh, uh, first one is that um, since you are a Buddhist and you have the knowledge about the concept of uh, mindfulness meditation according to the Buddhist traditions and also since you are a Western scientist you have this understanding of uh, this mindfulness uh, practice that is going on in the Western uh, uh, scientific community. So um, what are the differences in terms of understanding of the term? the mindfulness and the meditation part of it uh, you also uh, between the two of these traditions uh, and the second uh, part of the question is, uh, is that uh, it's related with the brain and so uh, in our whole system uh, of our body uh, which organ is the most important I asked this question to again Eric at the, uh, the neuroscience teacher that we have doing our workshop and he uh, told me that uh, he believed that brain is the most important organ in our whole body system. So do also believe that uh, brain is the uh, most important part? And so if or if not, then um, can we live without a brain? Okay, maybe I should start with the second question. I think it's probably a bit more straightforward. So, which organ is the most important? I don't think you can live without the brain. Actually, you probably also cannot, I'm pretty sure you cannot really live without the heart. Well, maybe these days there are some heart-like machines that could take over some of that function, but, you know, you need both of these devices to function as an organism. So, I think that's pretty clear. Um, as regards the difference between sort of mindfulness practiced in the West and meditation maybe as a spiritual path for enlightenment, which is how I interpret your question, um, I think one of the, the important distinctions already came up this morning um, in terms of, you know, mindfulness is typically um, pursued with a motivation to feel better is for people who are not who have mental suffering and they just practice it to feel better um, whereas meditation as a spiritual path you can actually not practice when you're not mentally stable and well so and actually then once you are in a stable and healthy place only then you can start to pursue it as a spiritual path to well gain enlightenment to 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 look for a deeper reality of things and a deeper meaning um, of what it means to be human and um, what it means to live 
a good life. Now it doesn't mean that those two are cleanly separated because it often occurs, I've heard from some Western mindfulness teachers um, who have also pursued a serious Buddhist path. Um, for example, um, uh, uh, Stephen Batchelor and Michael Cheskelson have been, uh, I think to some extent, been Buddhist monks as well. Um, and they said, you know, sometimes actually they get people who first do a mindfulness course to feel better and then switch into uh, really more taking, up, taking it up as a religion to really change their perception of reality and, 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 and go into these deeper concepts. So I think a, pr a primary difference is really in terms of the why people do that and then how they, that changes their outlook on what it means to be a human being and actually one important uh, while well, I have the microphone. Well, one important concept that I think might be helpful here is that, you know, is your primary focus, um, is it become being a, a successful being? Is that the meaning of being a human being? That's what we're taught often in the West, either implicitly, explicitly or implicitly. Uh, or is it something deeper? Is it, you know, about connecting with a deeper reality where it's not so much about me, but it's about a larger whole, which is, as far as I understand, is, is where it becomes more of a spiritual path. So actually your complete value system changes, and that's, I think, when it starts to become more of a, uh, a Buddhist path or, a, or some other spiritual path for that matter. And that, that might be the difference that we're talking about here.